My name is Lori Bass. I'm an army vet. When I grow up, I want to be a mass murderer. I've had fantasies about killing people. This is how my murder fantasy will play out. Fear is a horrible thing. I've guy. had horrible fantasies thing. about killing people. I climbed on top of him. I put my legs on his legs, and my arms on his legs. them upside down by their private parts. And then I brought the barrel of the gun up, right up to his temple, right here. I had a lot of, a lot of fantasies it. about just beating the crap out of him. I want to tell you in his eyes about what it is beautiful to have obsessions about. To hurt me, maybe even kill me. My name is Jessica Lucas, and I've had fantasies about killing people. One person in particular, my son's father, he was a freebase addict. He had a $1,200, $2,000 a night habit. At the time we were together, he would always cheat on me, he would always steal from me, he would always beat me, and I tried to leave him. Seven times I moved myself and my son away, and he found us every time. Whatever little money I had in the house, he would come and he would steal and use it to support his habit. I had a lot of a lot of fantasies about just beating the crap out of him with a baseball bat. And one night he came in, he was high and he was hallucinating, and he came in through the window. I was sharing the room with my son because that was the only way I could keep him safe. So we were in the same room together sleeping, and he crawled in through the window, saw my son, and he was hallucinating, and he thought that I was sleeping with another man. So he started to beat me and my, my son was able to get away. He wasn't hurt. But my son's father, he, he hit me, he hit me over 20 times. I finally got away, I kicked him in the junk and uh, was able to get away and I crawled out the window to get outside and was trying to go away but he ran out the front door uh, and he caught me on the front lawn and he grabbed me by the hair and dragged me back into the house by the hair and he just continued to beat me and finally um, someone called the cops. Someone saw or heard and they called the cops and the cops came and he went to jail and I went to the hospital and I was at the hospital and I would not stop bleeding and that's when they found out that I was pregnant and I miscarried because he beat me. He beat the life right out of me. That's when the, the fantasies changed. It wasn't a fantasy anymore. Now it became a plan. We would never be truly free unless he was gone, so so I bought a gun. And then I just waited, because I knew it was only a matter of time before he found us again. And finally it did. We moved again, and he found us. It was two weeks before Christmas. We had no money, because any, any time I managed to get something, he would come in and steal it. There was no heat, no electricity. I didn't have any presents for my son. He went to bed crying, because he was hungry. We only had a little bit of food in the house. I was sleeping in our room and I heard a noise. So I got up and I, I looked through the door and I only, I only opened it up a little bit because I knew it was him. Through the little crack of the door I could see through into the kitchen. And he was in the kitchen eating the last bit of food that we had in the house. And so I grabbed the gun and I, I almost did it right there. And then I thought, no, I need to wait. And I waited for the quiet. And I waited for the quiet. And I kept thinking over and over in my mind what I was going to do, how I was going to do it. And I waited. And I waited. And I heard him. And I waited some more. I wanted to make sure he was completely out. Finally, I knew the time was right. I opened the door really, really slowly, and I held the gun really tightly, and I walked very quietly and very carefully. And I held it there. And I thought, I could do this right now. It can be over just like that. <laughs> it 
but I didn't. So instead, I woke him up. I gave him a second to realize that he couldn't move and that there was a gun to his head and that I was in control for once. And I told him to leave and never, ever come back. If you ever come near me and my son again, I will kill you. And he left. I haven't seen him since. And that's my story. My name's Adam, uh, I'm an Army vet. Uh, I did a couple tours in Iraq um, with 1st Infantry Division. Right now I'm a sales agent for a, it's a local financial investment company. I've never been officially diagnosed with, with post-traumatic stress disorder, but um, I, I have a, a, a lot of things that, that happen to me, like um, I'm, I'm always afraid. I'm always, uh, I'm, I'm always afraid that um, everywhere I go that someone's actually there just to, to hurt me, maybe even kill me. And I, could, I could sense it everywhere that I went, the looks and the, the, the sensation and the feelings of what everybody was doing, and I can't get over it. I think I understand why that is, but I, I, I deal with this every day and it's, it's a struggle. Fear is a horrible, horrible thing. It eats you, and it consumes you, and it leaves nothing else behind. And I deal with this fear every day of my life now. I have pretty severe nightmares. In, in one of these nightmares, um, I'm, I'm alone in a room. I'm sitting in a chair, and, and I can't move, and I, I can hear footsteps, and all around me is, is darkness. and. And the footsteps kind of echo and get closer and closer to me. And, and a shape comes from the darkness and I can see in his hand that there's a, there's a gun. As he gets closer, his face comes into the light and I, I realize it's me. And, and I, I, I shoot, I shoot me. When I grow up, I want to be a mass murderer. That was the opening sentence of a journal entry I wrote for my second grade language arts class. I was responding to the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I was eight years old then. I was raised by my mother and my father left home before I was even born and he never came back seeing all my classmates being dropped off by men they called dad made me wonder where my father was. And I was jealous of everyone else who had someone to play catch with, or to ride bikes, or to wrestle with. The entry was a story about me as a grown-up, an emerging mass murderer with a Frankenstein combination shotgun and machine gun mounted to my arm. I used the gun to shoot anyone who messed with me. Not a random killing spree, but a revenge fantasy against nameless, faceless bodies 
all of whom may or may not have been my father. After I graduated college, I got a job with an insurance company, and I have been selling insurance for years. But two years ago, my mother passed away. I developed a wrong place, wrong time fantasy, meaning I have a gun in my car. In my fantasy, I'm driving around Glendale at night, waiting for someone to piss me off in a traffic incident. I then hunt them down like an endangered species in the woods. I'd follow them home, or to work, or to wherever they were going. I'd pull up slowly, get out deliberately, approach them and say a Clint Eastwood in Dirty Harry style line, well, maybe you'll understand this. And I'd pull my gun out slowly to get the reaction. They'd duck away quickly and I'd shoot them anyway. My name is Lori Bass. I want to tell you about what caused me to have obsessions about murdering people. As the late 70s, I went on a job interview. These three men told me if I wanted the job that I had to come back with them back to their condominium over in Encino. That they had paperwork and for things for me to sign and were going to train me for the job. So I agreed because I needed the job. And I got to their place and I think they put it in my drink, but they were able um, to drug me. I ended up somewhat passing out, and next thing you know, they were on the bed, all beating me all over and they all raped me one after another um, and did it several times. They used different objects that they shoved up me as well. Well, I was able to get away because eventually they all passed out, so I snuck away, but I had no way of getting home and I had to walk home. My clothes were all ripped, I was bloody, I was beaten, I was in a lot of pain. It took me quite a long time uh, just to heal over this, but the scenario of them doing this over and over and over again to me uh, kept going on in my head. And it caused me nightmares, it caused me all kinds of problems, and all I wanted to do was get back at these three men. And so one of the ideas that I came up with that I was obsessing over and over and over again was I was gonna break in to their condominium and then I was gonna drug all three of them. And everything they did to me, I was gonna do to them. And one of the ideas that I would obsess about would be to hang them upside down 
by their private parts and causes them the pain in their private parts that they cause me and use objects on them and in their areas and stick things up inside of them and torture them just like they did me. And then, after doing that, I wanted to take gasoline and pour it all over them and then set them all on fire. I didn't want to get in trouble for it, but I obsessed about doing that for years and planning different ways to do it um, as to how to get in and how to kill them all and this and that. I didn't do any of the things, but the obsessions and the thoughts about murdering these men to this day, once in a while will come to my head. I just hope at this point that they are not doing this to other women. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm 24 years old and I'm a bartender here. I make everyone smile with a drink, one drink at a time. When I was young, I watched this movie. It was about a mom and a son traveling across country on a bus. The bus stops at this gas station for a long pit stop. The mom sees a bar across the street. She tells her son, stay here. She then proceeds to go inside the bar, and then a stranger comes up. He romances her, buys her a drink, tells her that she's beautiful, and then asks her if she would like to dance. She says yes. The stranger then leads her to this dark alley, and they dance. Then he murders her. It's only natural that you would think that I would empathize with the son. But that's not the case. I actually relate more to the mom in the sense of being romanced by a stranger into your murder. People often ask me, how would I like to die? And my answer is always the same. I will be murdered. Matter of fact, this is how my murder fantasy will play out. I'm walking down a street at nighttime in a big city. I'm greeted by a stranger, a beautiful stranger. You know, very easy on the eyes and very kind. He began small talk and I've never turned down a conversation, so I converse with the man. We talk for a little bit and he proceeds to ask me if I can help him with something, help him with heavy boxes in an alley. So with me being naive, I said, sure. He takes me to the alley and I look around and there's no boxes. Then it dawns on me. This is it. This is the end. And then he stabs me, completely all over, particularly in my chest. The pain is excruciating, but it's peaceful. While he's stabbing me, I look in his eyes and I see rage, but it's beautiful. And then I ask myself, why me? Why little old me? Then I think, why not me? He could have chosen anyone 
in the world. A loved one, hell, another stranger, but he chose little old me. Well, he slices my neck and that is what makes me die. And there I am. A bloody, but beautiful mess. I hear papers cry. I watch them grow. They're like much more than I'll never know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself, what a wonderful world.